Buenos días a todos. Buenos días a todos, bienvenidos eh, a esta nueva charla del Centro Argentino de Ingenieros. Eh, esta vez estamos empezando e inici iniciando el nuevo ciclo de charlas Sky Talks. Eh, esta vez tenemos el honor de tener al ingeniero, al señor Matt Ridley, eh, quien va a ser el orador de esta charla, y al ingeniero Pablo Beres Artúa como moderador. Eh, Pueden ir dejando sus preguntas a través del chat de Zoom. Eh, las mismas se estarán leyendo en un espacio al final de la charla. ¿Sí? Eh, voy a eh, darles un, una breve introducción de lo que sería eh, la biografía del, del señor Matt Ridley. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Koi Talks. Innovation has a vector of development by Matt Ridley as a speaker and the engineer Pablo Beresertua, president of the CAI, moder uh, has moderator. Now I will share uh, a short biography of Matt Ridley. Matt Ridley's books have won multiple awards and more than one million copies has been sold. They include the Red Queen Genomy and the Rational Optimist. His book, How Innovations Works, was published in 2020. He was founding president of the International Center for Life in Newcastle. Um, now I leave you with um, engineer Pablo Beres Artúa. Thank you so much. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Es para mí verdaderamente un gusto que podamos mantener esta este panel, esta conversación, eh, junto con Matt Ridley. Eh, creo que, como vamos seguramente a ver en los próximos minutos, Matt es una de las personas más interesantes eh, que hoy podemos eh, encontrar pensando lo que está pasando hoy en el planeta y lo que también puede llegar a pasar en los próximos años. Matt viene trabajando desde hace ya mucho tiempo en el tema de innovación y intentar entender cómo hacen las sociedades para innovar y cuáles pueden ser las consecuencias, no solo en, en el futuro cercano, sino en las próximas décadas, de esa enorme tasa de innovación que todos nosotros ya experimentamos hoy y que todo hace pensar que va a seguir creciendo en los próximos años. Como hemos difundido esta conversación, la vamos a hacer en inglés, eh, y les eh, contamos que en el caso que ustedes quieran o lo quieran compartir, esta conversación se está transmitiendo en vivo por YouTube y en YouTube se puede usar la función CC, eh, que es una función que permite la traducción en tiempo real. Justamente un algoritmo, tal vez hablemos de eso con Matt, que de manera automática y bastante bien traduce idiomas en tiempo real que todos seguramente usamos para ver videos y que lo podemos usar también para ver esta conversación. Así que paso ahora al inglés eh, y a, a comenzar la charla específicamente con Matt. So, good morning everybody. Uh, here we are uh, at the beginning of a talk with um, a, a person that I believe is a very interesting um, uh, human being, if I may say so. Uh, but uh, his uh, focus has been in the last years to try to understand, I think, uh, what it is that is happening in the world and how innovation plays a central role in what we are watching and we are experiencing. And also what may be the consequences of innovation uh, in the near future and a little bit ahead during this century. So it is for me a real pleasure, as I said before, uh, in Spanish to introduce Matt Ridley. Matt, um, has been presented at the beginning of our talk. He um, has several interesting experiences um, along his life, but he, he's been a journalist. He's lived in several countries, including the US. And um, he has been also a, a very prolific author with several books and, and some of them uh, very successful books um, that are very well known for a lot of people um, I can mention that he has been translated into 30 different languages 
Um, so we are talking with somebody that is uh, very much in the middle of um, the global conversation on what is going on and what may be the consequences of um, the, the impact of innovation. Engineering is at the uh, center of uh, what is happening. Innovation technology is uh, and has been for several decades, a couple of centuries, for sure, one of the driving forces. And it will be um, uh, like that in, in, in the future as well. Um, also, I would like to mention a, a very significant experience and capacity of Matt. Matt is also a little bit of a politician because he's a member of the House of Lords in uh, UK. So he's been also very much um, involved in uh, the design of policies and the decision making, if I may say, of a country uh, in relation to uh, several topics, but very much um, science and technology and innovation. So it is for me, Matt, a real pleasure to initiate this uh, conversation with you. Thank you, Pablo, very much indeed for that kind introduction. And it's a huge pleasure to be in conversation with you and to be back in Buenos Aires, such a beautiful city. I just wish I was there in person. In fact, I'm in Newcastle in the northeast of England. But through the wonders of innovation, uh, I can also be in Buenos Aires at the same time. That is so true. And, 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 and for sure, we will have a chance in the future, I'm sure, to have you here around. Uh, so let, let me begin uh, by, by going into your last book, How Innovation Works. Uh, this is a fascinating book. I have it here and I have read it a couple of months ago. And, and, and it is a book, let, let me see if the, the camera will capture it. And it is a book that is a, a very interesting one because it is very comprehensive. So you go into history, you uh, trace how it is that it has happened. There is a book. Um, in several dimensions, energy, transportation, health, and, and, and what may be the common patterns. So uh, what I would like to, to begin with is to ask you uh, a very basic question. What is innovation? And is there any news about that idea? Well, innovation, as you said, is the main event of the modern world. It's the reason why our lives are different, more prosperous, but also different in other ways from those of our ancestors, um, because we have adopted new devices, new tools, new rules, also new habits uh, over the years. And the process by which human beings come up with new ideas and adopt them uh, is innovation. But I make a distinction between invention, coming up with a new device for the first time, and innovation, which is making a new, new device affordable, available and reliable so that people will adopt it. Um, and that's a rather different process because having the first idea um, is only a very small part of the work. If you look at the history of the adoption of technologies, whether it's the internet or uh, the steam engine, um, if you like, you know, going a long way back or very recently, there is a long period of improvement, of adjustment, of lowering the price, of increasing the reliability before a technology really becomes widely adopted. And that is done in a collective way. It's not done by brilliant individuals. It's done by ordinary people, uh, quite often users as well as producers, consumers as well as producers. Um, so I'm, in a sense, in my book, I'm trying to democratize the process of innovation to get away from just the stories about one very clever person having an idea at the start. Uh, and instead talking about the, the process by which lots of people combine their ideas to produce uh, changes in society and changes in technology. Now, if you, if you follow that idea and if you see the, the cover of your book, you, you give a very significant play role to freedom. Why, why is that the case? Well, most of the features of innovation are require a, a certain amount of freedom of maneuver. You need the freedom to invest in ideas. You need the freedom to change the world without being stopped by somebody. But you also need the freedom to change your mind, to change direction. Quite often, uh, innovators start off trying to do one thing and end up doing another. I've got lots of examples of, of people who, who, who were trying to invent one thing and came up with something completely different. Um, so you mustn't have to get permission from somebody every time you want to change 
direction uh, as an innovator. Um, but you also need the, the freedom of the consumer to express their preferences. Uh, you know, in the Soviet Union, it wasn't possible for people to say, um, we don't like this food or we don't like these cars, could you pretty please produce better ones? Whereas in the West, it was possible for those views to be expressed uh, and to feed back uh, and result in the production of novel and better um, uh, types of food or types of, of car or whatever it might be. Uh, so um, uh, very much it, it is an uh, innovation is a fairly unexpected thing. You can't plan it in advance. It quite often surprises you with what it produces. And as an example of that, I would suggest that the search engine, um, the ability to search the internet is the most useful innovation of my lifetime. Um, I use it every day, I think, in one form or another. Um, and yet, and, and it was inevitable that it would be invented once the internet had been invented. So in the early 1990s, lots of people came up with the idea of search. Sergey Brin and Larry Page were the ones who made the most money out of it. They founded Google. Um, but if they hadn't met, we'd still have search engines. And yet, if you go back to the 1980s, you don't find people predicting search engines, saying, actually, once we've invented networks of computers, we're gonna, there's going to be a huge premium on the ability to search for the information you want. And actually, the people who invent the best search engine are going to make the most money. So in that sense, the freedom to be surprised by what innovation comes up with and to exploit it is also a crucial part of it. So I see it very much. Uh, why is it, um, as, I'll go. Sorry, I talked too long. Yeah, no, but my, my, my question is uh, uh, why innovation happens in certain places? Because if you go to the search engine, you will end up in Silicon Valley. Um, and, and, but if you go back in history and you, if you follow your book, there are certain locations where there is some, so to say, chemical reaction or I don't know what uh, that gives as a result innovation and prosperity and 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 then maybe in the same place it doesn't happen later on in fact if you follow the news you will see that even even there are several people and in your book is also mentioned that uh, california may not be as successful as it has been in the next decades correct yeah uh, very much innovation is like a bushfire it breaks out in one place and it burns very brightly but then it seems to go somewhere else. You know, it fades in one place and it starts again somewhere else. So in our lifetime, California has been the most innovative place on the planet. You could argue that China may now be more innovative than California. Um, if you go back um, 100 years or so, you would probably choose England or Germany or uh, somewhere like that. And if you go back earlier than that, you choose the Netherlands and then maybe Northern Italy. Um, uh, before that, uh, Arabia, before that, somewhere in China, before that, India. Um, it, it jumps around. What is the characteristic feature of those places at the time? And the answer really comes down to one word, and that word is freedom. Uh, these are not centers of empires. They're not necessarily even provinces of empires, although sometimes they are. Um, they are places where there are city-states freely trading with each other. Um, if you take northern Italy, for example, very fragmented at the time. You have Florence and Venice and Genoa and, and, and Pisa, where Fibonacci came from, and he transformed mathematics throughout Europe. Um, uh, so it, it doesn't require strong government or strong direction from the center. Uh, it requires merchants to be satisfying the needs of customers in a free way and using trade to come in contact with new ideas from other places. That seems to me to be the, the feature of an innovative um, part of the world. Now, people will challenge me and say, how come China is innovative? Because it is now a very communist, very totalitarian country. And for the last 40 years, it has been uh, politically very uh, authoritarian. Economically, not so. Entrepreneurs in China have been very free to start businesses, to build plants, to invent new devices, to raise money, all these things that, that entrepreneurs need to do. Actually, there's been many fewer obstacles to doing that in China than there have in California, say, you know, of, of the sort of bureaucratic nature. Um, 
I think that's changing. I think the Xi regime is now very different and is economically authoritarian as well as politically. You just look at what's happened to Jack Ma and, and um, Alibaba. Yeah. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think China won't see the same flourishing in the future. Someone else will have to do it. Maybe South America. Or maybe India, as you mentioned in, in your book. Yes, I've always thought that yeah. India is, is, is a good long-term bet as a country. It has a great tradition of uh, trade and commerce and openness, a very good education system. What, what lets it down is the infrastructure, the, 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 the um, uh, corrupt bureaucracy and so on. Uh, if it could sort that out, it, it's got a very good chance. And if you go back far enough, I think it's where it's all started. You know, I think that beyond the earliest Chinese civilizations, beyond the earliest European ones, uh, India was flourishing, um, uh, you know, two and a half thousand years ago. The Ganges Valley was, was generating innovations in those days. So it would be maybe its turn will come again. Yeah, and we will, we will come back to this topic, and, and I would like to talk with you about South America and even Argentina later on. But let me come back to how innovation works. And, 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 and within that uh, very interesting picture that you are telling us, I'd like to, to have, um, what is your take on institutions? Because if you, if you see, uh, we are now mainly nation states, it may be that in the future uh, we will become more city states, or we are maybe because as a consequence of urbanization and so on. But let's say our main institutions, if you look at the country, are still national institutions, and and they have power and they and they deal with uh, very important uh, aspects of any uh, economic activity, like for example money printing. So let me ask you, how do you see? institutions changing uh, if they are going to change and what may be the consequences of that well it's a very good question and i'm not sure i have a very good answer partly because i'm very bad at telling what will happen in the future but then so are many people <laughs> um and uh, i i i think you're right that the focus on institutions is is critical if you think about the sort of the virtual institutions of, of things like uh, the rule of law, uh, private property, um, uh, free markets. These are obviously very important parts of, of innovative uh, economies. But beyond that, strong education systems, strong research universities are obviously helpful. Uh, and uh, a a, 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 a vigorous economy where it's possible to raise money and to invest. So the venture, venture capital industry as an institution is clearly an important part of, of innovation. But one hesitates at this point because I then start to think, well, some universities become very stale in the way they think about the world uh, and some companies become very stale in the way they approach the consumer and not very innovative when they get big. Um, so uh, one of the important things, one of the, the most important institution of all, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a renewal institution, uh, a, an institution that allows startup companies, small companies to be founded by entrepreneurs uh, to uh, to try out new ideas. Because very often, the new technology that will displace an old technology doesn't come out of the big companies, the big universities, the big institutions. It comes out of small peripheral institutions that, that challenge the status quo and change it. So I think the most important institution of all is something that allows new organizations to break through. Um, uh, new companies, new startups, particularly, um, because it's the experimental nature of innovation that has to be encouraged. It's not a question of a clever person sitting down and saying, we're going to invent this, this, and this in the next 10 years. Um, it's a question of saying, we're going to set up the situation in which somebody will discover that there is an opportunity to invent some things, and we don't know what they are. 
Yeah, now let, let me take you to one of those institutions uh, and you mentioned it, which is education. Education has been, to many of us, the main institution at, at, at the core of all the successful countries and economies. And now we have an industrial education. We, we have, in many cases, and this is for sure the case in Argentina, a very fixed um, program and, 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 and very much um, uh, old-fashioned in some of their um, some of, let's say of their goals in, in many in many things. So how do you see education changing? And is it possible to educate for for innovation? And what may be the components of that proposal? So how how, how do we go about changing how we educate people, being that people are one of the main assets, so to say, if you want to innovate? Well, in a previous book, uh, I wrote about how uh, how um, old-fashioned a lot of education is. It is still based around the model of a teacher standing up in the front of a class with a lot of people sitting at desks looking at him. Um, and that is a model that was, it worked in ancient Greece. Um, it was reinvented in Prussia in the 19th century as a way of make, making children do what they're told. Um, it was... Uh, universalized throughout the British Empire as a way of making sure that administrators knew the same things, whichever colony they were sent to. Um, you know, these are these are habits that have very old-fashioned beginnings. And it would be nice to think that one could reinvent education in a way that was more in keeping with the availability of modern technology. Uh, and indeed, there are some fascinating experiments um, uh, done mainly in India showing that give people the right questions and access to the internet and make them work in small teams, four kids to a team, say, they will teach themselves the most extraordinary things. Um, so um, I'm suddenly forgetting his name, but the, the professor who did this work, who, who the, the film Slumdog Millionaire was based on, he is a friend of mine, and he actually did some of this stuff. He went to, to remote places in India uh, where they didn't even speak English really uh, much. Uh, they had very little um, uh, sort of facilities, but he would go into a school and he would say, here's a, here's a question. And the question is, I don't know, what is a gene? And here's a computer link to the internet. And I want you to work in teams, not alone, but in but not, and not in one group, but in lots of little groups. Uh, and I'm going to come back in a week and I want you to tell me the answer. And the teacher said, you can't do that. We haven't even taught them basic biology yet. Uh, you can't start with the gene. He said, no, no, just answer the question. And he came back and they said, it, it's a disaster, this experiment. You know, you, they've learned nothing. Um, uh, and he said, what do you mean? And the children said, well, you know, uh, when I try and understand what a gene is, uh, I realize that actually I know it's a sequence of... of uh, nucleotides on a chromosome but I don't know where it begins or ends and and I you know I discover that actually there are promoter sequences that turn it right you've taught yourself a huge amount already so I would like to think that education itself could experience innovation of that kind how to do that without descending into um, bad education that doesn't achieve its aims and just leaves kids surfing the internet I don't know, and I'm not an expert on that. You asked a different question as well, which was how do we educate people to be innovators? Yeah. And there, I think, I, I'm, I'm unusual in this respect, and, and I, most people wouldn't agree with me, but I want to be rude about the word creativity. I think we, play, we, we talk about creativity too much. We, t we, we tell children, you know, it would be wonderful if you were creative. And what do they hear when you say that? They hear, oh, well, uh, some people are special. They've got this juice called creativity inside them, and most of us haven't. And that's, that's misleading. I think we need to tell them that it, it's, these aren't gods, these people who invent new things. It's ordinary people sharing their ideas, collaborating with each other, trying to solve difficult problems incrementally, not in one big bang, and doing so by a process of trial and error. Just try something and fail, and then try again and fail and eventually succeed. So I, I want to 
I want to go into schools and tell them, and also universities, but particularly into schools, and tell them anyone and everyone can be part of an innovation story. Uh, uh, and it, it, it doesn't require you to be the cleverest person in the class. It requires you to link your brain to other people because it's between brains, not within brains, that we're going to come up with solutions. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. There are many topics associated to that, and we will get back a little bit um, uh, in a few minutes. But let me take you to economics. So um, this is uh, this is very interesting. I think uh, to, to to hear your opinion on this. Um, we do have some theory about economics, which typically fail um, uh, time and again, um, and there are several so to say, externalities and imperfect markets. And knowledge is certainly one of it. And innovation is also a main and growing factor into that. So what do you think about um, the, the, the difference and the change in paradigm from the economy of, um, uh, so to say, uh, not having much to the economy of abundance? Do you yeah. believe we are in an in inflection point where we are for sure suffering the consequences of a theory, which is not enough. This is for sure. I mean, all the global crisis and several of the countries that we know, including Argentina, um, one of the components of uh, how to explain the performance is for sure that you don't have the proper tools. Maybe uh, that tools are not the, the, the real ones. We will get into politics later on. But my question to you is, are we in a position, in a moment, where we will have to tell the economists, you don't know much about what is really important right now. We need different people thinking differently if we want to create wealth. Yes, I think that's true. Um, if you look at the history of economics, going right back to Adam Smith in the 1700s, he said two rather contradictory things. He said, on the one hand, uh, we, 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 we find efficiencies in markets. Uh, we, we develop ways of, of reaching an equilibrium where you offer the right price and I offer the right price and we both end up with a good deal. And that implies diminishing returns. That implies that as you get towards an efficient solution, there's no more improvement to do, to do, that there's some kind of perfect market out there that we will always be striving to find. And the other thing he said was that in a pin factory, one person can introduce a technological improvement that can make the pin factory much more productive because of the division of labor. So that you have people specializing and then, so 10 people specializing can produce hundred times as many pins as 10 people each making their own pins, if you see what I mean. And that implies the opposite. That implies increasing returns. That implies that the more you invest, the more productive the world is going to be. And for the next 150 years after that, Economists focused on the first point, on the diminishing returns point, and they thought right up to John Maynard Keynes that we were going to run out of innovations, that the technology was not going to deliver increasing economic growth forever, that, in that economic growth was going to decelerate. It didn't. It accelerated. Um, we discovered that the more we invented, the more we were going to invent. And the, fur the, the further we seemed to be away from a perfect equilibrium, and the more we were disrupting any equilibrium we had. Um, and this problem of increasing returns um, was one that economists were slow to take seriously. And when they did, they simply solved it by saying, ah, yes, in innovation, it arrives from heaven on earth and lands in our lap, and that's what changes it. And we have to put it in our equations, but we don't know where it comes from. Yeah, and that's uh, not good enough. And that's yeah. the, the theory of exogenous innovation. Exactly, yeah, Paul Roma. And then Paul Roma comes along and says, no, innovation is in itself a product. It's something you invest in, you produce. It is endogenous to the system. And I don't think that revolution is finished. 
Paul has got his Nobel Prize, but I think there's more work to be done on understanding uh, how innovation fits into economics. Th there's one idea that I'm obsessed by and uh, that I find um, particularly insightful, which is that the, 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 the big theme of human history in economic terms is that we become more specialized in what we produce but more diversified in what we consume. Yeah. Um, that, that if you go back far enough to hunter-gatherers, they, they consumed what they produced, no more, no less. Now you have a job. Your job is chairing a seminar online. That's a very, very specialist thing. I'm sure you do a few other things too, but do you see what I mean? And, yeah. and yet you are able to consume foods and tools and motor cars and movies that other people are producing. So the magic of uh, innovation is about matching together this narrowing of production, which we often lament and say, what a pity it is that we're more and more specialized in our work. But then we forget that we're more and more diversified in our consumption. Yeah. Uh, and that feels to me like the big theme that economists need to get their heads around and get their equations around. That is very important. But let me narrow it down to, to one question. Do we have to change the centrality of the, so to say, minister of economics and replace it for a minister of innovation in a sense? Is that the real new stress that societies and nations have to prioritize, which is not the case nowadays, but is that, is that a change that you see coming or not? Well, there are, I would hesitate for two reasons. The first is because the Minister for Innovation will want to do things. He will want to tell people what to in, in, innovate, what to, what to, what to make. <laughs> and he will get it wrong. <laughs> he will be too uh, prescriptive and not open enough to changing his mind. So, I mean, effectively, the UK government does now have a Ministry of Innovation. It's called Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, but its ministers talk about the importance of helping innovation a lot. And some of the things they say are very good, um, about making it possible for entrepreneurs to, to uh, innovate. And some of them are less good, like, as I say, trying to tell people what the priorities are for, for innovation. Let me give you a very specific example of that. In the last year, it has become clear to us that biotechnology is rather important. I think we can all agree, whether it's for making vaccines or for analyzing the genomes of new variants or for testing um, <coughs> people, whether they have in fact become infected with a virus. Um, but even before that, I think we were seeing the influence of genomics and biotechnology becoming suddenly much greater in the economy. And I think we were seeing the digital IT aspects of the economy beginning to run out of steam on innovation. I may be wrong there, but I think we're not going to, exchange our mobile phones for a new model quite as often as we used to 10 years ago, um, etc. Uh, and, you know, Moore's law has basically petered out. We're not going to see the same incredible improvements in the price and efficiency of computing going forward. There will be technological developments, but I suspect we might be hitting diminishing returns in IT just as biotech is accelerating. And I don't think that message has sunk through to politicians. They are still thinking in terms of artificial intelligence and um, uh, you know, quantum computing or something. They're not thinking in terms of how important biotechnology and can curing cancer and all these kind of things are going to be to the economy. Um, uh, of course, I could be just as wrong as they are, and it could be something else completely different. Yeah, but, but what it is true, and it is also in your book, is that you can speak about innovation speed and different uh, issues and different dimensions of uh, economics activity have uh, different speed uh, around time. So things happen at different speeds. And I, and I think that that may be the case. So let me um, 
let me now have a little bit uh, a question around power, so political power in a society. So how do you see this uh, innovation uh, uh, driven society that is surfing it up, um, changing the power rules of a, of a society? Do, we will see we will see what? I mean, how, how uh, we will see um, the typical industrial organization of, uh, so to say, um, a, 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 a elected representatives on a Congress and unions and corporations being disrupted by uh, innovation. Do you see a disruption? Because the other face of it is equity and um, uh, what, uh, not, not equity, but the distribution of wealth in, in, in the world is what I mean. So if you see the consequence so far, we have a very tiny amount of people and corporations um, uh, becoming uh, really rich as it has never happened in history. So on, on one side of the picture, we see that power is being concentrated uh, in a very few hands, people like all the technological gurus and uh, people like Bill Gates and, and, and the kind, um, and, and, and a few corporations and Tesla and so on are becoming very, very powerful. And the wealth of the world is concentrated in uh, fewer hands than ever. Now, on the other side of the picture, you see disruption and uh, several new opportunities and possibilities all over the place. So what is your take on how power and political power will change in the near future? Well, I don't know, is my first answer. Um, it's not an easy question, and nobody uh, really knows how these things happen. And a good way of approaching it, I think, is to go right back to the invention of printing 500 years ago and see how that disrupted the power systems of the day. And it effectively uh, destroyed the primacy of the Catholic Church in Europe and led to the Reformation. Um, uh, and it also uh, had all sorts of ramifications for politics uh, as well. Um, uh, and eventually it led to something resembling democracy um, because of the ability to print uh, pamphlets and documents and newspapers and so on. Radio was also a very significant invention in the 20th century and possibly helped the rise of dictators, actually, which is not a good thing. The internet and social media in our age is having a similarly surprising and disruptive effect and is uh, obviously disrupting the relationship between uh, politicians and people, enabling the rise of populists, almost certainly. Um, uh, polarizing society uh, through echo chambers and so on, um, and, uh, you know, possibly altering the way democracy works and so on. We may be seeing the birth pangs of a much more direct form of democracy where we, uh, we consult people on a regular basis through the internet rather than every five years through the polling booth. I don't know whether that's likely or not, but, it, but it's possible. We may be seeing the end of democracy. We may be seeing uh, the rise of authoritarian regimes again, uh, as many people are worried uh, is happening. Um, uh, and as far as the point you make about the concentration of wealth in a relatively small number of hands uh, through technology, it's both good and bad because the, the good side of it, which we, we saw 20, 30 years ago, and we liked very much, we saw it in the Arab Spring, we saw it to some extent in the uh, in the, the fall of the Soviet Union, was that uh, when people can talk to each other, they can undermine um, illegitimate regimes. Uh, and you can get uh, a, a, a much more democratic uh, element coming in through social media, helping people rebel, whether it's against the Iranian regime or, or something like that. That was the way we saw it 10 or 15 years ago. Now I think we're more cynical, aren't we? We think that actually these uh, technologies of social media are allowing Mark Zuckerberg and um, the Google 
people uh, and Amazon to tell us what to think and to outlaw certain ways of thinking, mostly for good reasons in their minds. But I don't like the idea that somebody is beginning to control free speech. Um, so I'm much more worried about the influence of big tech uh, in terms of speech than I am in terms of money. Um, I don't think the fact that, that they have, these are very wealthy corporations is the problem. I think the, the, the degree to which they have created monopolies on communication is the problem. And I think that is one of the big problems that we have to grapple with over the next decade. Now, before getting into Argentina, which I'd like very much to, to hear your thoughts, um, I, I, I'd like to take you to the pandemic. And, and, and what, what do you think uh, is happening? And, and is, is pandemia, as many people think, accelerating the rate of innovation and the rate of change in the world? And what may be the new normal? If you have to mention three, four um, vectors where you see that we will change our life, not in the, in the far future, but in the near future, that we will be living uh, in a different context and with the positive and negative consequences, which they may be? Yeah, it's a really good question. And again, we must be humble before the facts and be prepared to be, uh, to be put right because um, a year ago, uh, you know, I was making predictions which turned out to be wrong. For example, I thought that the ability to test and trace would now enable us to get ahead of the pandemic and bring it to an end in every country. Well, that was wrong, as it turned out. It turns out that the ability to sequence the genomes of the virus, the ability to test whether people have it using fast PCR testing has not helped very much at all. Uh, and we are just as vulnerable to a very infectious virus today as we would have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I was wrong about that. I actually thought that the new genomic knowledge we were getting, the ability to sequence the things, to test for them, to use DNA um, amplification techniques to test for things was gonna make all the difference to controlling infectious diseases. Couldn't have been more wrong. An old fashioned idea called a vaccine, however, is working very well, but we were too slow to develop vaccines in the past. We didn't uh, focus enough on the importance of improving vaccine development. And the pandemic has, the pandemia has brought, has summoned forth a revolution in vaccine manufacture, which I think is going to be enormously important. These DNA and RNA vaccines that have been tested and have uh, got to market first, uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca one, the Moderna one, and the BioNTech Pfizer one, are the future of vaccination, I'm sure. They will, I think, transform the way the world treats infectious disease in the future. But they are probably also going to prove to be the best way of tackling cancer. Uh, they promise that we will actually be able to have a revolution in the treatment of cancer in the years to come. I suspect they will also help us deal with allergies and uh, autoimmune diseases, which are another big problem. And who knows, they might even help us with Alzheimer's and things. So I think that's the biggest takeaway from uh, the pandemia. Uh, and the woman who tried for many years to get this idea working and failed for many years and lost her grants and got demoted, but eventually succeeded, is, I think, a great hero. Her, her name is Katalin Kariko. She's a Hungarian working in the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a good example of how something that she started 20 years ago has come to fruition now. The other way in which the pandemia has changed the world and will change the world is what we're doing now. Um, I haven't really, with, with one exception, when I went to London about six months ago, I haven't been to the capital city of my country in a year. Uh, and yet I have, I took part in a parliamentary meeting already today and I took part in one yesterday and I'm talking to you in Buenos Aires now. Um, the, the fact that video conferencing was around but we didn't use it much until the pandemic came along is, I think, a really interesting point. Uh, we have changed our habits, not because of the new technology coming along, but because we've had to, um, uh, and the technology has always been there. And it's now reached critical mass. You can now assume that everybody knows how to use these 
these these software packages. Um, and they're very unsatisfactory in lots of ways. I would much rather go for a beer with you after this. Um, I'll have to go and have a beer on my own, which is not the same. Um, but you get the point. <laughs> so I, I think those are two ways in which we've we've changed. I hope we haven't now become a very fearful population that cannot handle risk, that doesn't like to travel, uh, and uh, is 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 ultra cautious about everything in the world, but I fear that that might also be a long term effect of the pandemic. Yeah, and, and your, your last point may be also very dangerous because people may get used to more authoritarian kinds of um, context because they oh. want somebody to protect them, and, and and this is just the opposite to freedom, right? I'm very I concerned think. about my own governments addiction to telling people what to do. Uh, I can't see it giving it up very easily. And you know, in theory, it's a democratic government. In practice, it, it quite likes um, uh, just ordering us around. Yeah, but some of the things you mentioned will also have secondary and, and tertiary consequences. Because if you use more of these tools for meetings, for, for, for working, then what is happening is that maybe the downtown of the cities are not going to be used as much as they have and the prices are going to change and, and maybe that will have consequences on, on several other things. So for example, how much you use transport and also if you go into health, then people will live longer because we are accelerating solutions and, and, and ways to get people to be healthy for a longer time. And that will have consequences for the numbers of the economy of several countries. And so it may be, I don't know if you see that, but this acceleration of the pandemia and this, so to say, good news. And also, let me tell you that there may be bad news. One of them may be the authoritarian way of thinking and the change it, but there may be others. I don't know. But the, even the positive ones may have very disrupting consequences to some of the institutions and some of the uh, ways we are handling uh, countries and cities. Do you see that happening really or not? Uh, yes, I mean, I'm quite, I'm quite optimistic about the effect on cities. I think uh, there will, it will accelerate a trend which was already happening, that we use city centers for entertainment rather than for business. Um, uh, and if, you know, I, I was, I was in central London in, at Christmas time, not last Christmas, but the one before, as it turned out, a very risky time, perhaps, you know, it was just when it was all starting. Um, and I was stunned by how many people there were uh, in, on all the streets around central London, how many tourists there were. And it, it occurred to me that actually, this is what the city's for, you know, get rid of all these uh, ridiculous office blocks and just let's have lots of nightclubs and lots of parties and what it is people want to do in a city um, you know it's it's a place where young people want to go and meet other young people let's redesign cities around that um, uh, and the rest of us when we want to work can stay at home in the countryside where we enjoy going for a walk um, so I quite quite optimistic about that I'm less optimistic about the aging society point I think we were nowhere near solving the problem that we live a lot longer but spend uh, a lot of that extra life uh, in ill health. And we need to, to try and uh, come up with ways of tackling aging specifically rather than just the symptoms of aging. Um, and I'm not sure we will. But on the other hand, I'm also very intrigued by the statistics showing that we are not breaking records for long life. It's 30 years since we broke the record of 122 years for the longest lived person. We're getting more people to 100, but we're not getting more people past 115. We found the sell-by date on human beings. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. Now, let me take you, Matt, to Argentina. So virtually, of course, it, it will happen in person, I hope, in the near future, but vir virtually. Is it, is it a good news or a bad news for Argentina what's going on? <laughs> um, well, uh, I think it's all up, it's up to Argentina. I think there is a huge opportunity for countries to seize a place in the innovation game. I think the the, the period when China was uh, supplying the world with 
both products and innovations is coming to an end for political and uh, economic reasons. Uh, and that uh, the world is going to be looking around for other places to supply it with its needs. And in the world that comes, uh, the importance of um, the service industries, of software, of education is going to be more and more important. And these are strengths for Argentina. There's no question about it. And I'm very impressed by the, the growth of uh, unicorns in Argentina, um, uh, Mercado Libre and other things. You know, it does look to me like there is an opportunity for, for Argentina and Latin America generally to punch above its weight in, in the years to come. The one area that I'm really intrigued about, as you know, is biotechnology. Uh, and there again, I've been in conversations recently about how to liberate the agricultural biotechnology sector in the UK. And the one country we keep getting told to look at is Argentina, because you have taken an approach to the new CRISPR gene editing technology, which is um, not the same as genetic modification um, uh, and likely to be much more trustworthy and safe because it doesn't involve moving genes between plants. Um, you've taken an approach to a, a lighter touch regulation of gene editing. And the immediate impact has been that most of the gene edited crops that are being produced in Argentina are now coming from smaller companies or research institutions rather than from big companies. And that's the revolution that I've been hoping to see in biotechnology. Um, because when, when you set it up like Europe has set it up, that you need eight years of struggling to get a bureaucratic approval for a new product, uh, then you play into the hands of big companies and you make it very difficult for small companies. So I, I foresee that, 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 that Argentina really is leading the world in that particular one area, agricultural biotechnology, and we're watching you very closely. Now, at the same time, there may be several challenges to that industry, which is very, very competitive and strong in Argentina. And that may be, for example, artificial meat, or also it may be new innovations for uh, developing green protein in areas where you don't have enough water, which is one of the things that Argentina has as a comparative advantage. So closer to the demand. So, uh, I mean, what is going to be winning? Um, the, the rate of innovation and the possibility of uh, uh, producing better things or, or, or some of the innovations that are going to be solving the demand, um, the supply to the demand closer uh, um, because of the logistic cost then, uh, for example, China, which is one of our main buyers right now of our products, is uh, going to be able to produce food close to uh, its own territory or within its own territory out of uh, new innovations that are coming. What, what do you think? Well, this is a really good question. And on the whole, uh, the cost of food is coming down, the availability of food is going up, uh, the amount of land you need to produce a given amount of food is shrinking all the time. It's down by 68% in 50 years. That's because of improvements in genetics, improvements in um, uh, crop practices and, and so on, um, improvements in machinery and so on. So the world as a whole is finding it easier and easier to feed itself, even as the population continues to increase. So I don't, th I don't think that the future of a country relies on saying, well, we're all going to be starving in 20 years, so... Uh, the price of food is bound to go up, so that'll save us. I don't think that is the case. I think the price of food will continue to go down and commodity agriculture will be quite a tough game to be in. But at the same time, population is still going up and it's getting richer. And the Chinese are developing a taste for more meat and more uh, valuable products uh, and are not finding it easy to supply them. Um, uh, they've had a bad pig disease in recent years, and so they're going to huge demand for imported pork and so on. Um, Africa is going to be a continent with a population bigger than China and India combined uh, with towards the end of this century. At the moment, Africans are not big importers of food from the rest of the world, uh, let alone things like meat, um, uh, but they will become so. Uh, 
And so there are going to be opportunities to supply increasingly wealthy consumers all around the world uh, for a country like uh, Argentina. Um, uh, and I, I, Matt, I, I remember, uh, out of your opinions, I remember a conversation that I had with Steve Blank. You may know him. He's, uh, he's uh, one of the, uh, so to say, gurus out of the Silicon Valley, Steve Blank. He's written a couple of books. Um, Steve about how Blank? Blank? Yeah, Blank. Steve Blank. Um, his main book is uh, The Four Steps to Epiphany, I think. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he's been also an investor in, in some companies and he's given several talks. And at one point I had a, a meeting with him. Uh, we were talking about Argentina and he asked to me, well, what is the size of the population? And I said, 44, 45 million people. And he said to me, well, then it's not going to be an innovative country because if you don't have a market of less uh, of over 100 million people, 90 or 100 million people, then it's very difficult to have a sophisticated demand in a near area where you can provide um, added value, so to say. So what is the role of geography? So do you see, if you look at the world right now, you will see that still the, rich, the richer countries are, are, are the same. China is the main news. But, but, but Europe and, and Northern America are the main uh, areas where you have wealth and uh, richer societies. So do you see that, and this is the case of Argentina, that um, the rate of uh, spreading wealth across the world is going to be uh, very significant in the future as a consequence of all these trends or not? Yes, I, I don't think I agree with, with uh, that, that, that 44 million is not enough. Because look at Singapore, look at Hong Kong, look at Iceland. You know, you can be a very small country and very successful because you're, the consumers that you're supplying to are not your own country. They're all the markets around the world, uh, you know. So, so I, 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 I don't see that happening. Look at Canada, you know, that's a relatively small country. Well, it's a big country in space, but a small country in, in, in population. Um, uh, and the, 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 the big news of the last 50 years is the decreasing global inequality. People forget this. People hear about inequality getting worse, but actually people in poor countries have been getting rich much faster than people in rich countries uh, in the last 50 years, mainly Asia, but also increasingly Africa. Um, so so the, 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 the gap between the average wealth of uh, poor countries and the average wealth of rich countries has been shrinking dramatically. You know, most countries are now middle income countries. Um, uh, and the yes, there are richer people within those countries and some poorer people as well. Um, but globally as a whole, uh, that, that there's an equalization going on. And I think that's likely to continue. I think, as you see, Africa experiencing dramatic rates of economic growth, which it's starting to do. Um, it will really catch up with Asia to, to some degree. Well, that, that was a very pessimistic opinion. So I'm very glad to hear that. Now, <laughs> what, what would you say would mean two, three, or whatever, how many you, you would like to say, advices on what the government should do. So what is the government uh, having to be concentrated on um, in order to be able to, uh, so to say, get something out of these opportunities? So if you are talking, let's say we have a meeting with the main people in our government, in Argentina, and they ask you, Matt, you know a lot and you have been studying a lot about innovation and how it happens and where it flourishes and uh, what, what we should do. I mean, um, if we are uh, really having a blank page and we are open to any advice, what uh, do you think we should do in order to uh, get Argentina to be a real player in the new wave of innovation? Well, um, I would say two things. The first is rapid decision-making by government agencies. I, I look around the world and I see by far the biggest problem facing entrepreneurs is the time it takes to get a decision out of a bureaucracy. Uh, whether it's uh, a, somebody inventing a new vaccine, going to a medical regulator, or somebody trying to build a new factory and encountering zoning and pl planning or whatever it might be. Um, uh, again and again, the problem is not that 
the government says no, it's that the government takes too long to say yes. And one of the uh, clear lessons of the pandemic, particularly in my country, in the UK, was that the medical regulator decided to act in a novel way when, it, when approving vaccines, um, decided to work in parallel streams rather than sequence, um, uh, and deliberately speeded up the process. On the, in the European Union, they didn't change the process. And they therefore assumed that we must have cut corners and we must have done something dangerous in approving the vaccine so quickly. But it's not proved to be the case. We were just as thorough. We just did it in a different way. Now, I think the FDA in America has also learned that lesson. Just getting a quick decision out of a regulator is incredibly important. Imagine somebody who wants to make a lot of money by inventing something and he can't decide between a video game or a new medical device. If it's, he goes with a video game, he can start on day one. There's no permissions needed from anybody. If he goes with a medical device, it'll probably take him four years to get approval and a lot of money. Uh, so inevitably we've been diverting entrepreneurial energy into video games and away from medical devices. Now, the, the second thing I think that I would say to your government or mine or anything else uh, is get the incentives right for entrepreneurs. Make sure that they can invest, uh, get rich if it works, um, uh, do research efficiently in a tax efficient manner, um, uh, 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 and find it easy to do business. Just simply think of what you can strip away in terms of bureaucracy that, that, that slows people down in, in investing and doing business. Don't think in terms of subsidizing them, giving them grants, giving them uh, uh, contracts. Yeah, well, procurement can be important. There's lots of, lots of smaller things, but I think those are the two big ones getting the incentives right, and getting quick decisions. Excellent. I think those are very key issues. And for sure, they are, they should be in the priority in, in a country like Argentina. So um, I, I really appreciate your opinion. And I, I, I believe it's, it's a very strong message uh, and a very simple one. So um, there is no, uh, no, nothing behind it. It's very clear if, if you, if you if you do that, then you facilitate and you give freedom to the system to operate and it, it will generate. Um, I think at the same time, it's a big challenge because it comes back to, to, to the power discussion and, and who has the power to, to control the timing and to control the decision making and to, in that position, being able to somehow get out uh, some uh, convenience out of that. So that struggle, I think, is, is, a, is a big struggle probably in the near future. People willing to innovate and, and the system um, somehow uh, generating friction for that. And a consequence of that, maybe people moving out of the country and um, finding or looking for a possibility to do that and to, to get um, to the, the, the opportunity to, to, to prosper in another location. So it's a very serious question um, because uh, a difference of innovation probably, and this is a question to you, comparing with uh, a previous phase of development is now that a lot of the power is in the brains of the people and they can move away. So you cannot stop them to move away. So it's not like you have your investment in, in a mining facility, you have your investment in the brains of the people. And if they don't like the way you are ruling your system, they can always somehow uh, it will take them longer or shorter time, but they can move away. So um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a critical issue, I think. There's a, uh, very, there's a very interesting theory about why Europe became so prosperous 500 years ago when China didn't. Um, China went backwards and Europe suddenly came from being a very backward continent, became a very advanced continent. And one of the reasons was because it was fragmented. And so again and again, you got clever people saying, I don't like this regime I'm living under. I'm going to move next door to another one. You know, Gutenberg, the guy who invented printing in, in Europe, you know, he moved from um, 
uh, Mainz to Strasbourg, you know, um, uh, John Locke went from London to the Netherlands, you know, um, Thomas Hobbes went from London to France, um, Voltaire went in exile from France to Germany, etc. The, the ability to hop across a border and get away from a regime you don't like keeps the politicians honest. <laughs> Uh, and it was an important part, you know, whereas in China, there was nowhere to go. You know, you couldn't escape the, the, the em emperor. So, Matt, I think it's been, a, it's been a, a, an exciting conversation. I, I really thank you for all this time and, and your openness, I have to say, to, to share your ideas. And, and I, I really believe they are uh, key ideas and uh, not uh, clear enough in, in, many, uh, in many locations. And in the case of Argentina, uh, for sure, I see that, and, and, and you so, because you said so, uh, as a huge opportunity. I mean, if a country like Argentina is able to understand that it has uh, an incredible capacity in its people and in, in its history uh, to, to generate innovation, uh, and it uh, somehow promotes it and is able to control several of the uh, deviations we have in our system to the old economy and to, to generate the possibilities of the newer one, uh, then we will probably face a, a complete change uh, because I, I definitely see this time as, a, as a, an immense opportunity um, for, for the countries and for the societies that are able to understand it. Uh, now, the key challenge is whether our political and institutional system will be able to understand it or not. And in the case of Argentina, uh, one of the main issues uh, is geography. So if you are in a neighborhood where you see that people close to you are changing and they are innovating and they are prospering, uh, then it may be a lot easier than if you are far away, where it may take you longer to uh, get the message and to see it by your own experience in your own eyes. So. Uh, geography is going to be is going to be central, um, much more so than than we expect. Um, uh, th this is, of course, my opinion, uh, but uh, somehow I believe that uh, geography has a role to play. And you mentioned that in history, you could find places where innovation flourishes, and maybe now there will be several more places. Uh, but you have to be one of them, and you have to be, have a leadership able to understand it and to somehow make decisions for that to happen. Uh, uh, so there is, there is, and this is a question to you, you, you really stressed the idea of a bottom-up um, process. Um, what do you think are the issues for the top-down? So is that a laissez-faire to let it go or, or, or you have to promote um, some uh, changes uh, that are going to be um, facilitating that change you do have to facilitate change from the top there's no question about it you can't just assume that that it will happen in a bottom-up way but you have to think in terms of facilitating rather than creating the change a good example is you know uh, building a road network or in, in introducing a standard for electricity plugs or something like that you know these are the kinds of things that you can do to, to help for me the most clear example of legislators putting in place laws that encouraged technology without understanding which technologies it would encourage uh, is in the late 1990s in the united states congress under the clinton administration passed a series of laws that were designed to encourage and allow e-commerce. And they were essentially the, the laws that led to the rise of everything from Facebook to Google to whatever. And they had their bad side as well. You know, they've, they've left us with some of the problems like, you know, the fact that these uh, platforms are not publishers and are not liable for what's on their content and so on. But on the whole, it was a spectacular success of encouraging uh, unexpected burst of innovation in e-commerce and the use of the internet for, for business. Um, and it came about because of specific legislation put through Congress. It wasn't an accident. And I think that's quite an important lesson to remember. I mean, it would have happened anyway, 
but more slowly and in a different way and maybe in different countries. It, it started very much in America because of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So final, I think, comment for you and, and, and question. Uh, other, I mean, you, you can add whatever you, you like, of course, but um, what, what is going to be your next book? What are you thinking on? Well, I'm already writing a book. Um, it's about the origin of the virus. I think it's a very important question. Did it, uh, how did it get from a bat into a person? We now know that none of the animals they tested in Wuhan were positive for the virus. We've not found the virus in any animal reservoir. That's very puzzling. Um, we do know that an awful lot of research on these bat viruses was taking place in Wuhan. So the laboratory leak has to be a possibility. Um, uh, I don't think we're getting enough access from China to what went on. And we need to understand it because if it was a laboratory leak or if it was a natural spillover, these have very different lessons for the future management of the world. So that's what I'm focused on at the moment is writing a book about that question. That's very interesting. And you will get into geopolitics and all kinds of uh, interesting issues because you are dealing with China and, and a huge consequence for the world economy and society. Well, if, if I'm found dead, you know why. <laughs> and a final comment. Can you share with us very briefly, what is your work in, the, uh, in, in, in your house uh, as a member of the, of the uh, Chamber of Lords? Can, can you share yes. that with us? Yes, the House of Lords is a, a full chamber of the British Parliament. So there's the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Commons is elected. The House of Lords is mainly appointed. It has much less power. You know, under the Constitution, it, its job is to revise legislation not to reject legislation. Occasionally it gets into a big argument with the House of Commons, but it usually backs down. It's a very large group of people. There are nearly 800 members, so it's not a efficient or slim body, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it's like a gigantic think tank advising government, often in a very critical way, sometimes in a very supportive way. Um, uh, it's not supposed to be a full-time job. It's supposed to be something you do in your spare time as part of your uh, the rest of your work. Um, uh, and there's a lot of talk about how to reform it to make it more legitimate, but they keep failing to reform it. Um, and so I'm still there. So, Matt, thanks again. I think it's been a pleasure. We have several messages here. Um, congratulating you for, for this presentation and all the ideas. And um, I, I, I really appreciate your time. And as I said before, your, your kindness and your, your openness, because I, I think it's a privilege to, to have uh, this kind of conversation and to, to listen to, to somebody who is uh, thinking in a very free way, I think, uh, and, and giving us um, simple messages, but very important messages on how to think about our present, but particularly about our future. So thank you very much in the name of the Argentinian Engineering Center. And it's been a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Pablo. It's been a real pleasure, a very interesting conversation for me too. And I, I look forward to that beer one day. So it will be. Bye-bye. <laughs>